watching West Harford Community Television. You're watching West Harford Community Television. You're watching West Harford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, I'm Sarah Connor and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's show we're going to be discussing red shirting. Who does it help? Who does it hurt? And what is the Connecticut State Legislature doing about the potential two and a half year age difference that can show up in our kindergarten classrooms? My guests this evening are Christy Luchin. She is a kindergarten, te kindergarten teacher at Whiting Lane School, and she is also the 2010 Connecticut State Teacher of the Year. My second guest is Nancy De Palma. She is a principal at Whiting Lane School, and she has many years of experience across all ages in education. And my final guest is Senator Beth By. She is a state senator of the 5th District of Connecticut. And she is also one of the well-known and respected um, experts on early childhood education. So let's first just talk about what is redshirting, for those who don't know. Redshirting, for the most part, is really holding your child back uh, rather than sending them on when they reach their age to go into kindergarten so that you have a little bit of a, a period that you can make that decision. Children have to start kindergarten at age seven so that ch parents can actually hold them back for a while. So that's basically the concept. Just one minor correction. Yep. Last okay. year, the legislation changed it to six. Six. Okay. So, but it was seven forever. Yep. So they have crazy. to, by law, start by the time they're six. You are not right. allowed to hold them back. And now is that if they turn seven in the kindergarten year or they, ha they cannot be seven to start the kindergarten year? What is that? Yes, they can't be seven after, you know, they have to be six in September in when September. school starts. Okay, okay. So uh, 60 Minutes just did a big show on red shirting. There's a lot of news articles and discussion about it. What is the big deal about red shirting? What, why is it such a, a topic of conversation? What is it that parents are struggling with and, and does it hurt anybody? Well, I think that um, children at the age of five already vary so greatly in their developmental skills, their abilities, what they know, their background knowledge. Um, so we are already teaching in a very dynamic profession. Um, with redshirting, what happens is you could start the school year in September and you could have children who are six or turning six, and then on the other end, you could have children as young as four and a half entering your class. So you already have the variance, and then you add another year on either end, and it creates potential challenges um, for the curriculum, for the teacher, for the administration, for the parents. Um, so it's, it's a very serious and important topic to be talking about. Yeah, and, and I think that in a town like West Hartford, it's really exacerbated because this really is an upper middle class problem. I mean, I, I had an eight month old at the playground, I can remember, and someone saying, a December birthday, are you going to send her? I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea what she's going to be like. When, but parents do start yes. perseverating about it as right. soon as, probably as soon as they're pregnant, but right. definitely uh, when they're young. Um, but if you're in low-income communities, like I've worked in Hartford, it's not a question the day your child is qualified for kindergarten, they go to kindergarten. So in a town where you have a mix of students, you have a number of students from low-income families, a number of parents who have the luxury of making this decision, you can end up with a two-and-a-half-year mm -hmm. gap. So it really does become an issue. Well, and it's interesting because I did not grow up in Connecticut. I'm not a Connecticut native. And when I had my babies, who are not babies by any stretch anymore, <laughs> Um, they, it never occurred to me that this would be an issue. Um, I have a December baby and she was not born in Connecticut. We moved here and all of a sudden it was like, wow. You know, it's a, and, and Connecticut is one of the last states that has such a late cutoff. That's exactly right. So, um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is, so you said the Connecticut law did just change. So let's talk a little bit about legislative. There was a lot going on about this last year. Year, yes, in the previous session, not in this session. Right. Yes. In 2000. 
2011. 2011. Yes. So yes. what happened? How did, it, how did things um, change? Well, there was a bill to change at kindergarten starting age. And the initial bill had funding to fund preschool for children who had birthdays between September and December so the children wouldn't be left out. Um, what happened as the bill progressed was the funding got pulled out. So now what's ha what would happen is we changed the birthday, but there'd be a cohort of children who were going to start in a formalized education program who would have to wait a whole other year. And those were generally students who were already coming in at a disadvantage. So um, once the funding was pulled out, uh, it lost a lot of support for people who were very worried about the achievement gap in that critical time of brain development. You don't want the child to be outside of the formal structure of school a whole nother year. So I think that's when it went downhill. So the age didn't, the admittance age eligibility did not change. It's right. still this uh, January 1st of the yes. year, right? You have to be five by January 1st yes. of the school year you yes. enter in. Um, but you we said, did change a start date. So that was the only thing that passed was we made it. You had to start kindergarten by six. You by had to six. start school by six. So there's seven. no longer the opportunity for a two and a half year difference? It can because if you have a birthday in October mm -hmm. and you're five and you start kindergarten, you'll turn six in October. Right. And then on the other end, you have to be five in that year. So you could have a December birthday and come in at four and a half. Mm -hmm and not turn five until December 30th. Okay. So it's not quite two years, but it's... It could potentially happen. Right. It's a large proportion of that young child's yes. life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, what, so what does that do as far as trying to... I mean, it seems like the children that are being held, and correct me if I'm wrong, but these are kids that have the advantage of being able to go to preschool as an alternative. So parents will say, well, I don't want them to go. I don't feel they're ready. Um, I'm going to give them another year of preschool. And so they've had another year of formal schooling. They start, and then you have these children that you're talking about where kindergarten's their first formal year of education, period. It's not just they have the advantage of going to preschool, but it's probably a quality preschool program that's got a very standards-based approach that really can give them a lot of um, additional education that even children who are in preschool might not mm -hmm. get. So what you're then is upping the bar for kids who have already been in there. Right. They're getting this added year. So when they come into the average kindergarten class, the average kindergarten teacher, and having been there myself, you look across, and we have a cap of 23. You look across that, you will have students who have had nothing. You will have students who have probably been in there since they were conceived practically. And then you have other children who have some kind of experience, might have been in daycare, so that you have all of these different age ranges, but abilities, onset abilities going into the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for the kindergarten teacher to really kind of capture all of that and really teach them. Basically, one of the main things they're teaching them is how to go to school. So that, right. you know, I had a, a wonderful, wonderful speaker once who said, there are two two really, really important educators in a child's life, and that is the kindergarten teacher and the high school counselor. And the reason why, which I am both, <laughs> um, and one of the reasons why, they said, because they set the future of your child's schooling. So depending on how successful they are in that kindergarten experience, mm -hmm. and believe me, children know. They know when they don't get it right and their peers are getting it right, mm -hmm. and they know that early on in the kindergarten. So it's, it comes down to success breeding success, motivation breeding motivation, and it really is difficult for the kindergarten teacher. So aren't these kids that have already had all of this preschool experience coming into a kindergarten class you're trying to manage across the board, aren't they bored? I mean, they, they're coming in saying, I know my alphabet, I can probably read. I mean, how, what do you do with them? Well, one of the challenges is that a master teacher won't, won't allow that boredom. Yeah. So one of the challenges for us is to really look at the curriculum, um, and a lot of times it's coming even from the parents. You know, that first conference that you have in the beginning of the year, you know, the, a lot of times the question is, well, what are you going to do to mm -hmm. keep my child learning at this level? And my child's already reading. What kinds of things will you do to differentiate? Mm -hmm. And so a really good teacher is going to look at that, is going to plan for that, is going to create a lot of small group learning opportunities. We'll use parent volunteers to have book clubs and, and a lot of different um, creative ways of addressing the curriculum. Um, it's hard. So are these kids, so let's, play, let's, let's put it out on the table. Are these kids really not ready 
or are the parents wanting these kids to have an edge? Um, what I've said, I've counseled hundreds of parents, and, and some thank me and others don't, but I, most do. And, <laughs> do they ask for the, your counsel? Well, one of, the things, one of the things that I say, and I say this through, I've watched this happen to my kids through high school, is you want your kids on the crest of learning. You don't want them in a class where it's too easy. I know you're saying, uh, Christy, what a, you know, a master teacher does, but that takes a ton, and not everyone's a master teacher, and a teacher can only supplement so much. You want your child challenged. You want them to struggle a little. You think of the things that helped you the most in life. A little bit of struggle is part of what helps you make your way in life. So you don't want kindergarten to be too easy either and so parents think well I don't want parents I think think I don't want my kid to struggle I want them to be totally ready and I think if parents back up a little and say okay you want them to be ready to you know sit for a circle ready to have a conversation able to control themselves you know all that internal control kind of stuff mm -hmm. but you also want them challenged you want it to be exciting and interesting and I think for me that's when I would push parents to say look they're basically ready you know, they're not 100% ready, they're 80% ready. I used to say to parents, you need a reason, a real reason. Their, bir don't, their birthday's not a reason to keep a kid back. Mm -hmm. If there's a reason, a social, emotional reason, or a cognitive reason, and they're right on the cuffs, fine. But the other piece is, you don't want to hold a kid back who has a learning disability either. You know, you're holding them back because of a developmental delay because then, you know, you're never going to catch up there and you want to keep the kids with their mm -hmm. age cohort. So it's a very tender balance right. to me. Well, and the other factor, so you know, when I was going through this with my December baby, and I surveyed everybody. I mean, I <laughs> talked to everybody. I talked to the preschool teacher. I talked to the principal of the school. I, I talked to the doctor. Everybody. I, and they, most of them said, it's a, your age is a point on a calendar, that's not what you should be deciding right. by. But I, I was trying to think, why was it I was so worried about it? And I think it was because what I wanted to know is how is she going to fall in the group? Because really, you know, she might have been ready, but then what is everybody else doing? And then how does that impact Good her? Point. You know, because if people, if everybody is holding their kids back, then, you know, it's all that relativism yeah. or relative... Yes, I, I don't know. Um, so is there any discussion of moving the age back? Because isn't that just going to cause everybody to start shifting their red shirting back? That's what think? happens in other states. I mean, if you talk to parents, it's the same discussion about different months. But there's definitely a press to change it from kindergarten teachers, I will say. I'm hearing that. I've never supported it because there's never been the support for the children who might right, who would miss lose. a whole year of schooling. Mm -hmm. I think. You know, again, and I'm not going to be in the business. I probably don't think for much, much longer. But the the piece that really sticks in my craw is that we need to be a pre-K-12 system, I think. I think we need to mandate pre-K. I think we need to have a pre-K that's going to allow all children to be on a level playing field so that they're mm -hmm. all going to come in ready, and they're going to be coming into ready, ready at their level so that they have taken the time to really go through some of the weaknesses that they might have had, some of the things they're struggling with. Beth talked about that internal gauge. You know, we want to have that self-regulatory behavior in place. So that's going to allow them to just really exactly. kind of move forward. When they have that in a very structured program, you know, it's going to be so much easier for them to move. I and mean, we really need to be that pre-K-3. We need to look at that. That's really where they're going to make the most gains. That's really where most of the research is going to tell you we're going to be able to close the gap if we get them early. Mm -hmm. But that early has to include pre-K, I think. So you had mentioned gap. I have read in some articles saying that, that um, this phenomenon of redshirting and our late entry, kindergarten entry date is, causing, is contributing to Connecticut's Absolutely. achievement gap. Mm -hmm. You agree? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always, I've argued for years with the current, I want you to take every kid out who's old for age and see where the districts rank then because I've always felt that they rank the districts based on percentage mm -hmm. pass and in some districts most of the kids are a year older <laughs> taking the same test with tons of support and background knowledge from mm -hmm. home and school and so it's not a really good measure and it definitely exacerbates our achievement gap you know artificially. And I, I think too um, you mentioned the test yeah. and I think um, one of the issues is that even in kindergarten, we're using some form of the test. Mm -hmm. um, and 
with, with you're speaking of st standardized assessment. In, measurement in, assessment. Correct. State so we're, we're assessing okay. students, and I think that that also plays into the fear of parents. Is mm -hmm. very early on in the school year, we're doing a screening to see where children fall, if they know their letters, their sounds, their phonemic awareness skills, and so um, that's very well known in town. And so I think that um, when making the decision, that also plays a part. And again, like what you were saying, if you have an older child um, who's had the additional preschool experience, who has had the additional years of practice, they're going to do better on that test. Yeah. So it's really important that, um, and I think kindergarten teachers in general are sort of pushing back against that. The test might be important, but so are other things. And we really need to look at the whole picture. We really need to take into account the individual differences. And that has to be communicated. Um, in the current exactly. and in, in two parents and not just using the test. Right. It's really interesting because what they're teaching in the kindergarten today is what I taught in the first grade. Right, so that was so the curriculum has changed. Thank you for bringing that up. I think people do feel like the curriculum is very academic in kindergarten. You mm -hmm. have to know a lot, and the expectations are so high. Mm -hmm. The parents are scared that kids aren't going to the be able to do it. The expectations are high, but you know, again, remember that we're fortunate. We're a district that has a full day kindergarten. Not all districts have full day mm -hmm. K, so you have a half day kindergarten. So that again, you're kind of playing catch up with that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're able to kind of spread a lot of that um, learning that Christy spoke about. You know, over the course of the day but focusing on the morning. But I think what happens is, is that in the half day, and I taught in a half day, you don't get that opportunity to bring as much of the play-based discussion mm -hmm. into place, you know, where you can do really wonderful things with plays, where kids can learn about characters and they can take on the characters and stuff. You don't have that opportunity in a half day kindergarten. We have it a little bit more, I think, in the first grade, but it's still a curriculum that's very, very packed. I think that when we look at the Common Core State standards that are coming down, that that's going to change a bit. I think we're going to shift, and you're going to, not that we're going to be spending a lot more time on going in deeper with kids as we should go in deeper with them and getting to them to look at things like text complexity even in the kindergarten, but really being able to kind of look at a story and not just hear the story, but hear the richness of the story, hear the richness of the characters and so on, hopefully being able to get the kids ready for that. You look at a child who doesn't have that background information, doesn't have that uh, language back, uh, mm -hmm. bank, that word bank, it makes it difficult for them. So that's another part of the job yeah. that falls on them. And, and I think parents need to know what Nancy's saying about taking roles in play. Why yeah. that's so important right. is that you know, that is what's the basis of story. So if kids are constantly moving center to center and not being able to make choices and not being able to take a character and go play in dramatic play, mm -hmm. they're missing out on internal controls, on assigning tasks to each other, on that mm -hmm. active engagement with each other and with materials that really builds important cognitive skills that I think have been pushed out of kindergarten because of some of the early literacy. And, and I think we need to shift to an early language and literacy mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. what we're finding is certainly in a lot of these urban districts, they are getting literacy, 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 tested, 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 mm -hmm. and then they get to third grade and they don't have the background knowledge to right. go. And when it comes time to add comprehension, the tests fall right off. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've been trying in this town to keep a balance, but it's, it's hard because the push down mm -hmm. pressure, and, and frankly, we just passed a bill this uh, last week that takes kindergarten out of the one to six certification again which has really caused a problem. There are fewer teachers prepared for preschool to grade three than there used to be because about nine years ago they changed that. So now you'll find more teachers teaching kindergarten with special, specialized training for working with young children again. And I think that will help yeah, some of this good. active engagement. Right. Right. So, what, so let's, let's go <coughs> way beyond, and maybe I'm sure all of you have something to say about this. So someone's red-shirted. Let's take both sides. Someone's red-shirted. They start old. They have all these advantages. Let's assume they have these advantages. They're rocking the tests. They're doing awesome. What happens to them when they get through third grade, middle school, high school? Are they still way ahead? What, what is your experience, your uh, knowledge of it? Hard to say, but let's say in a perfect, perfect situation like you just described. You never, they're going to have advantages way from the start. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have a lot of an advantages that are going to accumulate over time. Mm -hmm. So it's probably going to be that child who's going to have a better understanding of, do I drink and drive? Probably not. They're probably going to be a little bit more focused relative to the kinds of peer pressure decisions that they have to make. Remember, they're older. So socially, they've got a little bit mm -hmm. more going for them as well. And I think you're going to see that these children, 
pretty much the ones you're just talking about, are going to have lots and lots of support all along the way. Mm -hmm. So I would see that these are the kids that uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, who are going right. to be the outliers and who are going to probably be very, very successful in what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just going to take a little, I'm going to take another side yeah, that's that fine. because there is mm -hmm. some data that shows that um, kids who are older, the junior and senior in high school, actually do have more behavior problems. You know, they're ready to be out of the house, to be independent. Mm -hmm and they're still hanging around. So, so there are, when you look at the data, and it's across a lot of people, I think Nancy's right, for many it translates into that, but for others it translates into, I mean, you're older, I don't want to be, you know, I'm ready to be out of the house, and right. there are uh, later behavior problems, and, and there's some research that bears that out. Is there a stigma among, and even in kindergarten, being older or being, being the oldest or being the youngest, do, do kids recognize that? I wouldn't say that there's a stigma, mm -hmm. but they're very aware. Um, if they're sitting next to a child who is a reader and a writer mm -hmm. and they're just developing those skills, um, we, we do deal with um, frustration. We deal with issues of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, we have to very carefully place children and be very um, aware of what's happening because um, children do perceive things mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. um, and there are children who don't care, you know, okay. who just are very happy to do their own thing. There are children who care very much mm -hmm. and who feel it. Mm -hmm. And, we, and uh, teachers need to be very savvy and right on top of that and, and make sure that we're minimizing um, some of that. Mm -hmm. So what about the kids that start young? And let's look at them in high school. You know, my daughter will be driving later than all her friends, which I'm kind of psyched about. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, is there any long-term ramifications, assuming they're doing OK academically? Uh, socially, I mean, there's more to it than just academics. There's the social, emotional aspect right. of it, too. But I think the older they get, and the, the, that, that age difference becomes proportionally less, less. of an age difference. Yeah. And so I think as they get older, they're less yeah. aware. I think you're really right. Kindergartners and first grade are so into their birthdays and yeah. how old they are and <laughs> all that. But as and the they cupcakes. Get, as they get older, <laughs> no cupcakes. You know, <laughs> it, it is sort of a, I mean, I have a daughter who's a, August birthday and was one of the last to get her license uh -huh. and uh, you know it was fine. And I, I think one of my favorite <clears throat> professional books is a book called Mindset mm -hmm. and mm. Nancy took one position, Beth took another. Um, I think that if we're teaching our kids the right things, if we're That's teaching right. them to persevere, if we're teaching mm -hmm. them that effort matters, if we're teaching them to be problem solvers and um, to look at things more critically, then w wherever they fall in that gap, they're going to grow up. To, right. to be that kind of student and mind, mindset talks about right. um, more of the red-shirted phenomenon, n not, in that, in, not in those words, but children who've had every advantage in life mm -hmm. and haven't had to struggle or haven't learned mm -hmm. those critical, important lessons. And they Can be a disadvantage. I think sometimes they, they yeah. drop they out of college and they don't they have, you know, they don't have so, those coping right. skills. They have so always really been told they're smart. Them. Right. Rather, they've always been praised for being smart versus their not for rather their than effort. for their effort. For their effort. So what happens right. the first time they, they meet a struggle or they, they fail, you know, psychologically they, know they think, do. wait a minute, maybe I'm not as smart as people right. think I am, so therefore they kind of shut down. Versus it, it was can a hard be exactly, problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the whole idea of perseverance is really, and right. you know, really being able to kind of push forward, getting the help that you need, mm -hmm. knowing that you might not get it the first time. That's what you want to, you know, congratulate the kids on, really. So what if you, let's say you don't redshirt a child, and I, I, I have to admit, I still have these conversations in my head. My daughter's doing great, so I, we may totally made the right decision, but let's say down the road, all of a sudden something comes up, or maybe it's not down the road, maybe it's in kindergarten, maybe it's in first grade, you realize this, it wasn't the right decision. What is the ramifications of holding them later than prior to entering kindergarten? You, you know, I love this question, if you guys don't mind, because, <laughs> because I think this is where all the pressure comes for parents. Right. They think there's a right or wrong mm -hmm. answer, and there is not. There is, you sent your daughter, if she needed extra support, you were going to give it. If she needed a different right. setting, mm -hmm. you were going to give it. If, if you send a child and they're bored, then as a parent, you've got to find ways to supplement and take them to the Children's Museum in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that it's do or die and there are lifelong consequences. It's one decision, it's one, one time, decision, right? And, and you make hundreds <laughs> right. every month 
that are going to have an impact on your child. What these two were just talking about in terms of mindsets mm -hmm. and helping your child see themselves as perseverance, persevering versus you know whether they're young or old. And I think if parents can get to that place, it takes a lot of pressure off. This is one decision, and whatever it is, I'll make it work. Right. So, so let's circle back to the legislative side, side of things. We have a couple minutes left. Do you think that we should be not giving the pa parents so much choice? I mean, why do parents have so much choice to say, oh, I don't think that they should go. Oh, yes, I think they should go. I mean, is that just too much power for the parents to have? I it's mean, should we, be trying to, <laughs> should we be trying to close that potential age range? And it seems like the only way to do it is to legislate it. What do you think? Well, do you think it, you should? It is. It's it, you know. But I get back to again. If you if if you're not going to legislate it that way, then we've got to really go looking at a pre-K, you know, right. pre-K twelve system. So address Period. the kids. So aren't address the kids. Early. That's really what you want to do. Is how can we get everybody into a pre-K program that's going to be quality? Mm -hmm. The only way that's going to happen is if if it's legislated that we are pre-K twelve system that we do that. Otherwise, we've got to do some other fix that's going to allow the parents who don't have that ability to help themselves, to give their kids the mm -hmm. background that they need, we need to help them. And we're so lucky. Listen to these two. This is what our I kids, know. This is what our kids and parents have, yes, helping for, them. Yeah, that's I right. mean, that's what it is. It's a community right. effort. That's right. Parenting is so hard. It's the mm -hmm. most humbling job any exactly. of us do, and we need support through these decisions. Right. Exactly. But we also need to know that we can make it work, no matter right. what we decide. So you counsel your parents to just take each child I mean, when you have well, those kindergarten uh, open in 30 seconds or less, kindergarten is it, open house, this is, you get nobody question, knows your child you as answer? well as you do. Right. Nobody right, exactly. knows your child as well as you do. Well, one of the most important things that helps us with kindergarten registration is an interview sheet that we have. And through that interview sheet, we're going to find things, nuances mm -hmm. that we would never be able to find out about. So even when you're sitting with every parent mm -hmm. you know, who's attending you, you're looking for what are the things that are going to, what are the kindergarten teachers going to find that are going to help their children to learn exactly. and to adjust to that kindergarten. Exactly. And that's really, and, and encouraging parents to ask for help when they need it or to be able to help us to know when we have to intervene to give them the help they need. If you have questions about your child's school readiness, be sure to contact your elementary school's principal for advice and guidance. You've been watching Life in Style with Sarah. Don't forget to tune in next time for a brand new episode.